Hello. Um, welcome to this panel, uh, Knowledge Production for Modern Heritage, Preserving and Making Accessible Historical Sources. Uh, my name is Lam Al Khatib. I'm an architect, um, art historian, and cultural worker. Um, since 2018, I've also been part of the team here at Hakave um, within the scope of what we call the Archive Project, which is a long-term project dealing with questions around archiving and the sociopolitical kind of conditions and consequences of archives today. Um, today, I'll be co-moderating this panel together with Philip Oswald, who now I will hand over the mic to. Um, yeah, it's, I hope we have everybody online, which we need. Um, uh, the first section of our, I mean, we are talking now about knowledge production in two sub-panels. And the first is uh, regarding the question of the archive and the resources, which is one of the important questions because we, uh, as I think was already clear from the first panel, of course, want to challenge the uh, traditions of architectural history writing and if we want to try to establish a new kind of uh, uh, historization of uh, the things we are uh, engaging in, uh, it's also of course a matter of uh, concern how the knowledge can be produced and what is the basis for this knowledge production. So we, in the first round we want to speak about the sources and in the second then about knowledge um, uh, in, in the way of doing research. And the first speaker is supposed to be Ula Saif uh, from the American University in Cairo. So I'm not sure if he is, she's, she's online. Okay, so, uh, super. So uh, she's uh, uh, directing the rare books and special collections library at the AU American University in Cairo and has curated many exhibitions in the last decade. Uh, uh, in, uh, based on the special collection of the AUC. Uh, she is co-founder of the Photographic Heritage Column at the Aram Online and a frequent contributor to the Arabic quarterly Al film published in Egypt. And she's publishing widely in different ways. So we are very happy that she is joining us from Cairo and um, so the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Sharing the, the screen, can you see it? Is my yeah, we can hear you. Okay. I can hardly hear you, but I will. Uh, I'll proceed with the with, with, with the screen. Okay. So um, so here we are. I'm presenting uh, our architectural collections at AUC, as you kindly uh, introduced me, and you probably all know us and all know our collections as the Hassan Fatih collection. However, there is a lot more that we would like to share with you, and many more collections. So at a glance, um, uh, what you see is the, uh, the names of the collections that we have, the dates of the lifespans of the collectors, but the date be be below it is the date the collection has come to AUC. So I will focus more on the lesser known collections, which are the Ramtis Wissa Wasif, Sayyid Karim, Gamal Bakhti, and Kamel Amin, and with special emphasis on Kamel Amin, who is still alive, and it's the one collection where the, 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 the donor and the architect is still alive and donated the collection during his lifetime as opposed to all the others where the collections were given by their heirs after their death. So uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague um, uh, Balsam uh, Abderrahman who is in charge of the architectural collections. However, our collections are always divided in sub-collections and, and uh, administrated by curators uh, according to the kind of the collection within the architectural collection. So there are more than just maps. What you see are the drawers and the architectural room, but there are also photographs related to these collections. There are documents, archives, magazines, and periodicals, and many other um, uh, items. And each one of these is administrated by a particular uh, uh, curator. So for instance, we have that what our architectural photographs um, the photographs related to the architectural collections from the Sayyid Karim collection look, look like. That's a glimpse of them, and they cover more than just uh, Egypt. For instance, in a particular collection, we could get some magazines and periodicals. They're not a consistent edition for, from A to Z, but we try and compose them as they come. Uh, material from within magazines is always, uh, also quite relative. 
uh, within the collections, as you know, architects are usually artists, so we find some other skills and artwork that they produce, and these are all also collected in a particular uh, um, uh, section. But also some, some of them have attended uh, lectures and give, given speeches and they recorded uh, in audiovisual material, and that also is within our uh, realm of collecting. Uh, as architects produce models and maquettes, ma maquettes, they're also within our collections. And what you see are some that were implemented, built, and others that were not. Uh, I'd like to start with the collection of um, Gamal Bakri, since we're speaking of models, uh, and, and you're in Berlin. So he is the architect of the Egyptian embassy in Berlin, and that's an example of the material that is uh, produced in the Gamal Bakri collection. So while you're there, if you have... Uh, if you have a couple of hours, look for the for the Egyptian embassy in Berlin to see how modernity was uh, produced in our uh, uh, collection. Jamal Bakri is also the author of this um, uh, tower in the Zamalek district. It's overlooking the Gezira Club, and it's a very controversial tower because there were many political issues after it was built. It didn't have a garage, and um, there were attempts of associating it with a, with, a, with a plot of land underneath the club, and it was a very controversial matter, still unsolved till now. And therefore, it's, the, the, the tower is there and never built. It's only an example of, the, of what happened um, uh, with the modern heritage available. So Gamal Bakri's collection includes 1,200 plants, 43 maquettes, 2,000 slides, of the 1,000 projects, 10 and 15 percent were actually built, and the temporal coverage is 1971 to 1998. Another important collection that we have is the Kamal Amin, Kamal Amin collection. He is an Egyptian architect who traveled to the United States in 1951, and since then he's been um, producing and working from the United States for Egypt and many areas, but there is a lot of focus in Arizona. So uh, we have received 2,000 plans from him, uh, some digital photographs, books and artworks, and clippings. Uh, he's still alive, and there's a lot of media coverage about him, as you can see uh, um, in that uh, slide. He's also the author of several churches in the United States. Sayyid Karim is another important collection because of his political involvement in many matters in Egypt from the 60s to the 70s. He's quite involved in the decision-making of the government. From him, we have 14,000 plans and drawings, uh, around 1,000 photographs, a lot of documents and clippings. He was quite involved in the policy making of the major master plan of the Red Sea uh, in, in Egypt, although many of his projections and plans were never implemented. And what we see right now in the Red Sea is completely contradictory to, to his uh, plans and were not implemented, yet it shows what was happening in the minds of the architects and the policy makers um, in the 60s and the 70s in Egypt. Uh, these are some examples of his work. He wasn't also only working in Egypt. He was quite involved in many Arab countries. So what you, this is an example of something he had designed for the, for, for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Here are some other examples for Egypt, for Nasr City and many other districts. He was also involved in many places outside of Cairo within Egypt. So that's a model of uh, construction for the Wadi Komombo uh, uh, in Aswan in Upper Egypt. Uh, he was also involved, was in the 60s and the 70s, this master plan of creating cultural centers throughout Egypt. And we see in a brochure that uh, was published all the, um, the models of the, uh, um, of the uh, um, cultural heritage uh, centers, and we see how the design that he provided for the Mansoura city is very similar to something he had designed in, in Kuwait. Another example of his works for Casablanca. And um, a, an architect that you probably all know very well, Ramsis Misa Wasif, and we tend to associate, associate him with um, mud architecture and, uh, and, uh, and the vernacular architecture. He, in fact, is the author of uh, several buildings in downtown Cairo. He is a, an example of his um, work before he deviates and he, he goes into the vernacular architecture. Um, the line you see at the bottom is an, is an, is an online exhibition curated by our, um, um, one of our uh, senior staff members and curators, and it's online showing all his work. We can pick the modernity in his uh, work. 
by while seeing all his uh, works. This is a model of something that was not implemented. It was meant for the Opera Square in Cairo. It's one of the major uh, buildings. I wish uh, we had seen it one day. Uh, it was built. Unfortunately, it was, it's not. Um, he's also, uh, he gets very courageous and his very bold lines when it comes to churches. He's an evangelical Presbyterian church in, um, uh, I don't know its exact location, but it was planned for uh, Cairo and it wasn't built. Uh, we all heard about, you all know about Hassan Fakhi and seen many of his publications uh, uh, and the authors of, two of the authors from our, working on our collections are with you in Berlin today. From Hassan Fakhi, although he is the, the mastermind behind uh, vernacular architecture and architecture for the poor, he was also involved in modernity in the beginning of his career. So uh, there are 6,500 plans and drawings. We have around 20,000 photographs and slides, a big library of uh, personal library of books of 1,300 books, periodicals and magazines, manuscripts and texts, and a collection of gouache uh, um, paintings. The temporal coverage is from the 1920s to the 1990s. And within that period of, um, uh, that we're covering here in this symposium, he has some contributions. Um, in his archives, a lot of architects would often give him um, drawings and tell him, look how ugly, look what's happening in the city. And he has kept a record of, uh, of these photographs. So although they're not works attributed to him and they're not his works, but you can see what he has been collecting as a document of, what, of modernity that was happening in the city, perhaps material that was never covered and never to be available in any other uh, uh, collection. Uh, here's an example of his own work. Um, in, in the 30s, uh, in a transitional stage between between classicism, Art Deco, and the line that you know about him. And as we are a library and we're collecting for the future, and we see that there are a lot of conferences, a lot of brochures, and a lot of real estate companies designing for the future, we have been collecting a lot of uh, um, uh, all the all all the brochures that we could get hold of of uh, the actual and current work. For, for, for the future. And with this slide that I would like to end, we were allocated only 10 minutes, so I, uh, um, I can't get into the details of all our uh, collections. So thank you for your attention. And, um, and uh, should you need more information, we're available for uh, questions and answers or for direct um, information. Thank you. Yeah, Ola, thanks a lot. Uh, we can come back to that uh, as we have uh, time for discussion and questions. So we, we can extend on that. Uh, but before we get to these questions, I would like to uh, introduce George, who already uh, present, uh, was uh, introducing the symposium in general. Uh, George Abid, uh, he is uh, uh, co-editor of the uh, book we are uh, having the conference for. And he is a co-founder and director of the Center for uh, 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 Arabic Center for Architecture in Beirut. He has been teaching in several universities. He has a PhD from Harvard, and he's actually, I would say, the one of the most known. And so, what we're trying to say here is that, uh, and the title of my presentation is an NGO as an archive and place of knowledge production. So, it's an NGO. It's not a research center. It's not a university. Uh, but it is trying to gather material and try to uh, put it at the service of uh, research and, uh, and general knowledge, not only niche research and scholarly, scholarly work. Uh, so I will go through the presentation. Uh, this is 2008. It was the same year that we started uh, the association. Uh, and it was, uh, uh, I, I gave this lecture here next, next door in Cottbus. And I called the lecture The Amnesic Phoenix. Now we do? Uh, I'm sorry. No, okay. No, Thank you. So I called it the amnesic phoenix. We have in Lebanon this uh, myth of the phoenix that rises from the ashes, but unfortunately it rises without memory. So we start every time uh, from scratch. So memory is important. Documentation is important. And at the time, the Hotel Carlton, which was, uh, I would say, mundane, normal architecture. It, it isn't spectacular in any way, but it meant a lot for the people because of all that had happened in it and it was demolished uh, uh, at the time. So we created this center with friends, colleagues, 
المركز العربي للعمارة the Arab Center for Architecture uh, this is our space it's a small but ambitious space in Beirut uh, we wanted to raise awareness about uh, architecture within civil society so it's not again dedicated only to uh, informed uh, scholars or universities we want to develop the cultural value of architecture uh, we want to develop a contemporary image uh, of the Arab world we will speak about this if you want in the discussion, uh, we want to discuss the issues of the built environment. So it's an archive, a research place. We want to promote knowledge and, uh, pro if possible, protect the buildings, and if not the buildings, at least the traces uh, left in photographs and, uh, and drawings and so on. I will move uh, to the type of projects that we do. Uh, we do also advocacy. Uh, in other words, we help uh, people who would like to preserve architecture, young people, uh, younger associations, people who have the drive to do it, but they don't have the information to convince uh, of the, uh, the importance of a building, a site, a neighborhood, and so on. So we try to put things at their service. We document, we have drawings, photographs, books. We have a professional library that is a, an open library. This is our librarian, Angelique. Uh, we do collect um, sketches, uh, technical drawings. Uh, it took us some time to learn on the task. Uh, now things are much more organized. Uh, we try to do it in the professional way, you know, acid-free paper, cotton threads. Things are becoming institutionalized. Uh, we have uh, these uh, audio recordings on magnetic tapes. Uh, now they are on MP3, MP4, so students and researchers come and listen to these interviews done in the late 90s. We have some beautiful drawings. This is the Electricité du Liban. There is an essay in the, in the book about it. Variations of uh, designs for, uh, by Ferit Rad for a house. Friedrich Ragette, is a, the, an Austrian architect who taught in Beirut. Grégoire Seroff, uh, drawing for a chalet. He did uh, two versions of a chalet. Beautiful drawings. So this is the first house in Lebanon with a planted roof. That was the early 70s. Uh, we have photographs by famous photographers at the time taken, uh, you know, with the tilt and shift lenses. Uh, and some of the buildings have been either demolished, some have been uh, disfigured and so on. So going back to the original conditions of buildings is important. This is the Maison de l'Artisan under construction. We have a collection of uh, color photographs and slides. This is uh, from a slide. Progressive designs for the time, this is 1972. Maurice Hendiye, a unique uh, chalet design. Uh, Asim Salam with this mosque in Beirut uh, of the 60s. The Rashid Karam affair, Oscar Niemeyer. Also, we have a full collection of photos during construction, aerial and other. Otto Bartning, for this is not known uh, to, to the German public, but uh, Otto Bartning, the famous German architect, designed the church in Beirut in the 30s before he was famous after the war for designing churches with recycled material from the, from the war. Uh, we collect also architects' brochures. They are important to understand how architects present themselves uh, in their uh, portfolios. This is a quite well-designed one with the, by, by Pierre Khoury. Uh, we have some digital ones, like this one, Qahtan uh, Aouni's brochure or portfolio, Iraqi architect. We have an essay by Amin Saden on uh, on Mustansiriya in, in the book. We are also part of a collective, which is the Modern Heritage Observatory. You have there people dealing with the modern heritage as photography, as music, uh, film, and so on. We have, there is a lot of material online. We organized meetings. We try to accompany education uh, by uh, inviting students and their professors to do some juries in our space. This was the first exhibition we did, the beginning of a project we called it. That was a few years back on modern uh, architecture in Lebanon. Produce postcards, so we like to disseminate to the larger public uh, the modern architecture, modern spaces, furniture, and so on. Uh, it's a space that invites uh, all sorts of people, uh, and the choice was not to be in a university to be open, to be in the city. 
We have uh, many exhibitions. I will run very quickly through these exhibitions. Art in architecture in the entrances of buildings. Building skins, relying on, on the drawings we have and photographs. Lot of debate. We invite urban designer, urban planner. This is about the recycling of a building in the fair by Oscar Niemeyer. Young architects, uh, uh, called East Architecture, they propose to uh, transform it into a carpentry place. We work with a larger audience also as kids. Uh, it's a modest project, but it's important to initiate them to architecture, urbanism. Guided tours are a major uh, component of what we do. Uh, we invite architects, planners, even uh, people who are not necessarily professional, but people who know their neighborhoods to explain what the neighborhood is about, its history, and what is specific about it. These are very successful uh, tours. We also, as I said, support the younger associations. This was a campaign against a highway that was supposed to cut in a block. For, for now, it's interrupted, and we hope uh, forever. We also managed to introduce modern heritage into the National Heritage Day, where people are invited to visit sites. I will show these very quickly. So it's in Beirut and beyond. And we also invite uh, contemporary architects, like working architects, to show their buildings and explain them, or people who have worked in a neighborhood to also present it to a larger audience. So several guided tours, museum tours, brutalism tour. I will, uh, that we also organized debates between two generations. There was a cut into, in, due to the Lebanese war and other reasons. So we invite uh, two architects of different generations to come and discuss what has changed since those, those days. So these were six. And now we're starting to put them uh, on, uh, online. So this, this is on YouTube already, discussion between Eli Harfouch and Grégoire Serov. This is a uh, late uh, architect, Burhan Tayara, a great Syrian architect, with Sinan Hassan in conversation with him. We also had this series of lectures between an author a writer and a planner or architect, because they both work on the city from a different perspective. We curated the Bahrain uh, Pavilion uh, at Venice Biennale 2014, uh, where we produced also a book, uh, which was the architecture from the Arab world, uh, a selection, 1914-2014. I show a few. Uh, we always like to publish in English and Arabic, which is also the case in this book that I co-edited with, uh, with Philip. Um, we curate exhibitions. This was for UNESCO and the Ministry of Culture in Kuwait, uh, an exhibition about modernities in the Arab world. So we had to choose one building that was very representative. It was a modest but very important, I think, uh, event. With these posters, this is, again, the Mustansiriya. I recognize this is National Library in Damascus. Uh, we also helped uh, Hala Yunis in the curation of her uh, Lebanese pavilion at the Venice Biennale uh, with the logistics and so on. It was a very successful event as well, 2018. Uh, and she published that book, The Place That Remains, about landscape and its importance. We also uh, moved uh, lately to uh, larger dissemination. This was with a, with a bank. We realized that... Uh, for example, by writing a small text and using some parts of our archive on their blog, you would receive 30,000 viewers or 40,000 viewers or 25,000 viewers, which is enormous. So we're now investigating ways to disseminate this, this uh, culture. Of course, the Beirut explosion came uh, and a lot of things changed in Beirut. Uh, a lot of damage we tried with a little bit of uh, I mean, with some difficulties, but still uh, to help by, again, disseminating this idea of proper restoration of considering modern architecture with its uh, details and uh, ways of doing things uh, that they were as important as uh, dealing with traditional mansions. So quick survey of uh, damage and, and uh, what was specific to these buildings. Uh, we did some uh, capacity building for uh, NGOs. And we produced this uh, manual, which is a modest, again, uh, document. But it is an introduction to almost to do's and don'ts when you deal with these buildings. It will be published in Arabic as well and will be online soon. 
And this is the last slide. It's about a new project, which is a roadmap for the creation of an inventory. We're doing this with a fund from the World Monument Fund, and we are helping the uh, Ministry of Culture to uh, institutionalize uh, this, uh, this idea of the inventory. Thank you. Um, George, thanks a lot. Um, I, th I would like to do it like the first round to f uh, pose the first two questions to Ola and you. Um, the, to Ola, the question, I mean, uh, maybe you can say a few words. First of all, since when does your archive exist and why it's so exceptional in the Arab world? I think it's like the, almost the only official state institution for archiving architecture. And second, I think it would be nice if you extend a few words. I think you found very interesting that at the end you mentioned that beside uh, uh, architects' um, documents, you also start to document uh, real estate brochures. Maybe you say a few word, more words about that. George, uh, then the second question is to you, obviously, and I was also very impressed by, by, by a wide range of activities and engagement you um, has uh, uh, shown to us. Um, but maybe also in your case, a few words. I mean, when did the center was established? By whom? And how does it work financially? I think it's uh, quite. I mean, uh, it's not so easy to sustain all these activities. I imagine. Yes, thank you. Uh, so it was established in 2008, 14 years ago. Uh, it was established by uh, myself and colleagues. Uh, we had uh, Jad Tabet, uh, architect, Bernard Khouri, architect, Amira Soloh, planner and architect, Nada Habis Asi, uh, also an architect, and uh, Hashim Sarkis. Uh, and uh, we, uh, the idea was that we had already, when I was doing my, my DDES, my doctoral degree, I had already gathered material, and everybody was saying, what will you do with this? It, it cannot remain uh, in a drawer or, or here and there. So we started with that idea, and at the same time, we wanted to fill this gap 
this gap of lack of uh, discussion about, uh, about uh, architecture. We were after the reconstruction of Beirut after the war, and very little was uh, discussed, where very little was put on the table. So this is how it started. And uh, now we're trying to, uh, to, to continue what Ola started to say about uh, the dissemination and so on. Uh, we also have an aspect I didn't speak about, which is a database. We have a database that is online, uh, and it is consulted uh, more and more by a lot of people, students and others, uh, and it is expanding. So we have uh, around 250, if I remember well, uh, architects, uh, nodes in the Arab world, um, uh, Arab architects and foreign architects, but who worked in the Arab world, and we do have also the work of Arab architects outside, and we spoke today about Sayyid Karim and others outside, and we also have uh, in the database around now maybe 800 buildings with the material on them. So it is a thread that people can start from in order to move to more, to deeper research. So dissemination is important. Finding the information is, uh, is very important for us in, uh, in that regard. How you are funded? I mean, funded, yes. So uh, we, we uh, like any in, in independent institution, NGO, uh, we are funded by uh, either donations or uh, by grants. So now, for example, we have two grants. We have a grant from the World Monument Fund that we applied for in order to do the inventory, uh, the roadmap to the inventory. And we have another grant also by Goethe, but it's different from this one. Uh, it was, uh, frankly, a very interesting grant because they called it the Goethe International Relief Fund. And it was directed to institutions like ours, small institutions, cultural institutions, and others who uh, suffered from COVID and all their performance was affected. Uh, and for us, it was clear that because of COVID, very few people came to the library. Uh, we could not organize debates and lectures, which is what we want to do. We could not even organize guided tours and so on. Uh, so we applied to this grant and explained that what we need to do is to shift uh, quickly towards uh, social media, towards information that is digital, and to expand the database. Uh, we also had, uh, we, 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 had uh, we were given uh, a number of copies of the Biennale book that we kept on selling uh, year after year. And now, uh, thanks also to the Goethe, we will get copies of this book that we will be also, you know, it, it will give us a little bit of a donation. And we survive on these, uh, these things. Super. So I think that's very interesting also, I mean, as Ola uh, already pointed out, that being not a state institution, you also develop another profile of activism. And so that is quite um, significant. And so we, I would like, to, before we discuss further, to introduce our next speaker, Labib El Mumni. I hope I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> he is professor at the architecture in, uh, School of Architecture in Casablanca. He's himself an architect, a co-founder of MAMA, Memoir de Architect Modern Marocain, who engaged a lot in, in the question of the modern heritage in, uh, in Casablanca and Morocco in general. And he is currently doing a PhD at the ETH Zurich with Tom Abermet who is uh, presenting also tomorrow. So we are looking very much forward uh, to your presentation. Thank you very much. I am very pleased uh, to be part of this. Uh, do you hear me well, right? Great, okay. I'm gonna share my screen directly. Okay. Um, so yes, I, I called my presentation um, sharing as a tool in the process of saving Morocco's modern heritage. Um, I think we are in the same profile as um, as the uh, as what George uh, uh, actually explained in his in his uh, presentation, and it's really interesting because um, I don't know if you know that George, but actually I've been uh, into your lecture when you, when you were in Casablanca, I think in 2011 or 2012, uh, as, a, as a student yet <laughs> at that time. And, uh, and it's very inspiring. I was like, oh, okay, I just like uh, went to this uh, lecture uh, and this crazy man just getting a lot of stuff and put it in his, uh, in his personal <laughs> space. <laughs> But, but in the end, it was very important, actually. And I think if today I'm doing this, is, is only thank to you, because in the, I think in our memories, 
we also have like a lot of uh, parts in our memory that we save things that we liked. And I think today uh, it's really uh, it's really nice that after all these years I'm, I'm presenting, I'm, I'm really glad. So, um, so yes, MAMA was an association that we created in 2016, me and a colleague of mine uh, who was also an architect. Um, but the idea is also, I mean, we focus on five uh, paths, let's say, uh, uh, to save the modern heritage uh, between 1940 and 1970. Uh, 1980. So this is the gap that we we actually found that was not uh, uh, shared enough and it was not explored enough. Um, so we do in five, uh, let's say, pillars, which are understand and explore, uh, research, visit and document, archiving, and then sharing. So today I'm going to just uh, uh, a bit uh, get you to this to this process of how we do archiving as a uh, as an NGO, not as an, a, a library or as, a, as an archival institution. So basically, uh, uh, these are the architects that we look uh, into their work a lot uh, uh, in, the, in our period. And I, I'd like it to, to emphasize the, the process in, in different steps. So the first step is photo to another photo. So basically, we only have this kind of pictures uh, and publication that exist, like uh, the, this uh, book by Udo Kultumann, uh, uh, which is really like a, a really nice space. I mean, we saw this picture and then I was like, yeah, let's look to, let's look to the state of this building today. And so we started doing these discovery trips and, and, and going and, and looking uh, into these buildings. So always uh, it was the idea of finding something in the internet or finding something in a magazine and then trying to locate it and trying to to find it. Uh, and this is not just uh, in Casablanca, where of course uh, I am from Casablanca and, and it helps a lot to be in the city and knowing those buildings. And this, this memory is always uh, getting us uh, to find stuff. But uh, we, we actually expanded at some point to go really uh, abroad Casablanca. That's why we, uh, our association is called Modern Moroccan Architecture, not just Casablanca because there is a really uh, very important situation uh, in Casablanca that is called Casa Memoir, and they, they've been doing a lot of works for at most, more than 20 years. Um, so yes, this is where it is at, for example. And this building, it was, it was in the book of Udo Kultumann, but then we visited it today. Uh, and so we saw the state of it, and this really helps us to, to gain a, a, an idea about the, post, uh, about the state of the buildings. And it's go, it goes into a lot of cities like here at the faculty uh, in Fez. Um, so uh, in the end of that, we always are very, let's say we try to be as disciplined as, uh, as possible in a way that everything that we just find, we try to gather and then do a publication and move to another thing. So it's very important for us to that everything that we do is always a publication and then we go to another action. So after doing this trip that, uh, that was 15 days in Morocco, a travel trip, then we did this publication that is available in the internet in our website where you have the map and then you have the location of, this, uh, of these buildings. Then we can go to photo to a drawing. So basically we have a photo, but then we are looking for drawings. Uh, and so this is really interesting and it comes to photos like this uh, photo of the school in Casablanca by Zibaco. And then in the archives uh, of Casablanca, we founded a lot of materials like this and we try to scan it and, and collect it. And it goes also in Agadir, for example, uh, this huge project, the reconstruction of Agadir uh, was very important in Moroccan history of modernism. And um, actually, there are many uh, materials uh, uh, available in municipalities that are completely, I mean, at some point, uh, we, we are into this discussion of uh, if someone told that, tell us that there is no archives, then that's the moment we are actually looking for archives, because there is always something out there. <laughs> so the, the drawings are really super interesting, it gives a lot of ideas about, uh, about the, the construction, about the, the process, about, uh, about the contractors. And so we are not just collecting uh, uh, information about the architect, but also about the contractors, about the, about the labor work and so on and so on. And this is uh, very important uh, uh, in, in, in establishing the memory. And then of course, uh, um, uh, as, as our main focus is not only scholars and, and students and architects and professionals, it's also the public, it's also everybody. Then we are also asking uh, some, some random questions 
like this building, for example, the courtyard houses, it was uh, very much published by the Aga Khan uh, Foundation because it won the Aga Khan Prize. Uh, so we were at some point saying, okay, we don't have much of the photos of those architects, but since the ceremony was there, I mean, there's certainly a photo of, uh, of the architect uh, getting the prize or whatever. So we started contacting the Aga Khan and after a, a long time, then we, they, they, they really uh, share with us one photo that is really, really, let's say, uh, very rare and no one had seen it before, especially in Morocco. And it shows actually the architect in the left and then the, the Aga Khan, of course. And, uh, and this is really nice also in, in discovering things. Then it comes to the last uh, process of archiving and trying to find stuff, which is uh, uh, we have like an archival drawing and then we are looking for other drawings. Uh, so here are the, some photos from the municipal archives in Casablanca that we spent a lot of time uh, uh, digging into it. And we found really amazing stuff that are actually not well conserved, uh, let's say. But uh, the idea is really to try to digitize as, the, uh, as much as we can. Uh, uh, and so these, uh, these drawings are actually uh, sometimes also uh, the thing that lead us to connect to what we know uh, in Casablanca. Like for example, we founded this drawing and then we found uh, the architect as Zaguri. So this gave us the idea that the building exists in Casablanca and we know it. And so we looked through it and then, and now we know that the building was done by, by Zivaco. And this is very important, uh, by Azaguri, sorry. And then we start doing the inventory to all of this. And so also trying to, con to connect with architects is very important. So this is a German architect who built a mosque in, in Agadir. So we contacted him and he was very gentle to, to actually uh, share with us some archives. Uh, 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 and this is some interior view of the mosque. Uh, also never seen it before. And we also contact uh, still a live architect like this, Abdrahim Shari today, he's uh, already 86 uh, years old and actually uh, he shared with us some of the uh, some of his archives and and also these stories we love also the stories behind the architect and this is like a photo really nice photo even before uh, after the independence of morocco uh, the visit of the king to paris where actually this architect was still studying and in meeting and doing this picture is really nice so uh, i'm uh, so this is the process let's say now i still have left three minutes and i, I can spend it in in showing you uh, uh, how we how we actually share this uh, all of these uh, things so basically the idea is to preserve and to preserve you have to know uh, what you are preserving you have to know the story behind what you're preserving and you can see here the pictures of the the state of today and the state of before and so you can see that there are so many things to save and also protect um, so back to this chart that I started with we launched a lot of conferences. So association is really very young. We only started in 2016. And so here uh, we did the centenary of a, a great architect in Morocco. His name is Zivaco. And then we did, uh, we also invited the uh, uh, famous scholars to also discuss and share with us their, their thoughts and their, and their archive, uh, their archival work. Uh, we did also like uh, during the Corona time, we did this live lectures in Instagram where we invited many architects from Algeria and, and, and also from abroad to talk about various uh, thematics. Um, and we also very active into doing a, a big event that gather a lot of people like this Heritage Day that we, we actually organized in 2018, where actually we, we are showing this to the, to the young public more. We work a lot in the schools, uh, with the schools as well, with the young generation. I think it's very important at least if they can only know the importance of architecture and, the, and it's really important for us, uh, especially that we are also trying to fill a gap in, in the public system where actually a lot of schools, they don't have much of these events of, uh, of trying to, to, to get to, to know more of art and, and architecture and so on. Um, uh, once again, the publications, and also we did the summer school last uh, 2020 summer. Um, it was very interesting for us and now we, Next week, we will actually print this uh, publication that talks uh, that has more than 30 buildings, uh, really in a good analysis and so on. And also, we work with the government, uh, we work with the public institutions, like we just uh, finished now the, a book about the heritage of the postal office uh, in Morocco. Uh, and then we show many buildings, the publication will be in French and Arabic. And our main project of the last uh, uh, last three years was this map, uh, the map of Casablanca, 
where we actually show 50 buildings of modern architecture. So all of these archives that I told you about, it actually helped us a lot to know the architect, to know the date, to know all these informations. If it was not for that, we would not actually make, a, make, a, make false statements, let's say. So it's very important. We did a huge exhibition in Casablanca. Uh, it has a really uh, good success in the end. And of course, we share everything uh, uh, in the internet. So in our website, uh, in our website, you have this archival material all the, already shared and people can ask us for high resolution. We, we also send it uh, in many times. So we work a lot with schools, uh, with, our, uh, with students, and also because we are doing also uh, guided tours uh, in Casablanca and uh, in Morocco in general. And, uh, uh, and we try to expand uh, this knowledge of Moroccan modernism abroad. So we are invited often uh, to do conferences in, in many countries and in many universities uh, uh, in the world. And to finish with that, uh, one thing that is very important for us, we launched, uh, we launched something that we really think very important in the architecture school of Morocco. We, don't, uh, we are not taught enough about our own modernism, let's say. So we launched, uh, uh, we launched a studio on modernism uh, in Morocco and, it, and we profit, let's say, from, from the fact that we are teaching at the school. So we can really uh, uh, do this. And I think it's in, even in our duty to, to actually uh, start sharing more and more about, uh, about this. And, and, I, and that, I take you to my, I, I'm already, I think, in the limits, maybe one second, just to show you the last thing that we did is we actually started uh, even applying for for some buildings to get them in the national heritage. So this, is, this works as a, as, a, as a dossier that we make uh, with all the information and so on and why it's important to save and so on. And we, uh, we start in applying with these uh, folders to the Ministry of Culture. Thank you very much. Lot, uh, Labib. Um, I think it's very interesting, uh, not only the um, activism uh, you uh, 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 fulfill, but also that the, the work you do uh, is uh, very much based and connected with research, um, not just archiving. Um, before I would like to enter a second round of this, uh, uh, discussion, I would like to introduce Tarek Wali from Cairo. He is another, um, I think in the, his case, uh, like one person initiative. Uh, he is architect, urbanist, and theorist uh, who is in the profession since more than four decades. In, in 1998, he's founded the Tarek Wali Center in Egypt to create a platform uh, for uh, uh, the engagement into the heritage. So it, the floor is yours, Tarek. Thank you very much.
Tarek. Yes? There is a difficulty on the one hand, we can acoustically very hardly understand what you are saying because of bad connection. And also regarding our panel, I think maybe you can say a few words about the activities with your archive. Um, because we, we don't have now the time to have like this general observation about the development uh, of uh, culture in Egypt. So maybe you can kind of wrap up with a, a short info on, the, on, on your archive. No, it's coming, it's coming. Yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, the, our, our project is on the documentation of this architectural movement and the architects mobilizing and to advance to develop a process and reduce the civilization gap to keep peace with the acceleration of the civilization movement. The architectural movement lived until the middle of the 20th century through the cultural monument stemming from the diversity and branches. The overall, the, thus over the course of four decades between world the First World War and the second one, Egypt witnessed a series of discussion of the issue of culture and civilization identity of architecture within the comprehensive Egyptian national movement. A new crystallization to put architects and architecture within the features and to evaluate of this attempt. Between the traditional and the modernization in all it constitutes two essential features in the history of architectural movement in the 20th century in Cairo. Our project, the Maniat Mosley, identified a preliminary inventory of Egyptian pioneers architects, which include 100 architects who represent this stage. At the beginning of establishing a digital archive for the history of the architectural movement during the project, we established a digital archive at Tari Wali Center Architecture and Heritage. We identified 20 architects as a starting point for documenting and recording all available and possible information and project, followed by steps to complete the responsibility. And they are Ali Labib Gab, Mustafa Fahmi, Hassan Mustafa Shafi, Mahmoud Riyad, Antoine Nahas, Charles Ayrout, Al Bilzananiri. Max Adre, Yomond Antonius, Sharif Nouman, Abu Bakr Khairat, Naoum Shabib, Hassan Fathi, Ramsi Sui Sawasif, Ahmed Charmi, Sayyid Kurayim, Fareed Shafi, Tawfi Abdul Gawad, and Yahya Zin. To document this, their experience and creation without going into evaluation of the architectural product itself, or even classifying it on forward-looking format, or analyze this based on ideas and position. Therefore, we document it at this stage with objectivity and to put the architectural experience as part of the overall national picture. Without reducing its role and fragmenting the whole picture of the nationalism movement. It is preserving the heritage on its comprehensive image we understand this heritage is in its, its integration and interaction with the diversity of the images, regardless of its different paths. Intellectually and creative, cultural and professional and artistic form. It is the experience of a society at a particular time. There are Jamani atmosphere, including the architecture within the comprehensive image. And thank you. I, before introducing our last two speakers, I would like to pose a question to Labib and George, because it's, um, uh, you both, for, I mean, in, in, for, uh, for the MAMA uh, work, it is in the title, and, but I think also the Arab Center of Architecture is focusing the modern period. And this is, uh, I mean, why that? Uh, why this focus? Um, uh, can you say something about it? You want to go ahead, Labib, first? Um, yeah, if you wish, yeah, okay. Um, 
Yes, so uh, I think for me, um, it has two main reasons. The first reason, I've never been taught what, is hap what happened in the modern period in Morocco when I was in the architecture school. So I, this is very important. And by the way, uh, the fact that I'm here doing a PhD is actually I'm doing a PhD on post-colonial studies only to know how, how is that possible that actually in six years of studies, we've never studied any Moroccan architect. So that's very important. Um, the second thing is that when we, we when I graduated as an architect, then I was like, yeah, I mean, we only know what's happened in the in the uh, colonial period from 1912 to 1956. But then after that, what happened in Morocco? I mean, uh, the like like 80 percent of what I see today in Morocco was built after the independence. So this this is how we started uh, we started this idea of making an association only for that particular period and with that focus uh, in Morocco. So I think those are the, let's say the two main reasons. And I, there is nothing, I mean, there is a, I still remember in 2016, when we just like Google, for example, uh, Abdeslam Farawi and Patrice de Mazière at that time, nothing pop up in, in Google, for, for instance. But today, if you Google it, and then you have a lot of things going on. And I think this is very important to share and spread the, the, the ideas about this modernism. Yes, okay. Uh, as you can see, I am from the pre-Google generation. <laughs> so, and the problem uh, then was more or less the same. I will have a very similar answer, uh, Lahbib and uh, Philip. When I studied architecture also, when we learned uh, history of architecture, it was the history of architecture of the West. And when we learned traditional architecture, it, it was our own. So modernism was the other. So we were just receivers. And around me, there was this city, Beirut, a modern city. And later, I learned about other Arab cities. So when I started teaching very, very soon after graduating, I was asked to give the history of modern architecture course. And I started putting within the course, that is, you know, the standard the classical course of modern architecture, to use local examples to explain certain things. And I started, uh, because of that, to look at it differently, to understand the qualities and the specificities of this architecture. And uh, then I decided to go and, and research it in more detail. And for the center itself, why do we uh, mostly uh, do that? Because there are other associations, like APSAD, like Save Beirut Heritage, and others that deal with 19th century uh, architecture. And we thought uh, there is a gap. Again, filling, filling the gap is, uh, is important. Okay, thank you very much. I think it was very, uh, you both us and it was very insightful of telling to me. And now I would like to move on with our last speakers of the panel. And uh, both are here in order to uh, uh, speak about the challenge to research certain things because we come both from countries which don't have kind of a proper archive for architecture as far as I know. And the first one of the two is Janset Chaucer. She is assistant professor at the School of Architecture and Built Environment at the German Jordan University. And right now she is doing um, further research in Finland, as we just heard <laughs> today, uh, yesterday. And her research focuses on history and theory of architecture, urban planning and design, especially in relation to the conceptualization of architectural heritage, identity and belonging. And she has a contribution in the book uh, on uh, a big project in uh, Amman, John. Um, okay, thank you. Um, okay, this works. So, um, actually, I was quite happy and quite jealous to listen to hear about the um, archives in Lebanon, Morocco, and even Egypt, uh, amazing information. So, today, I will um, I'll be talking about my humble experience and looking uh, for information about the project I have written for, about in the books, which is a sports city uh, in Jordan. So, this project was built in the 60s. It is uh, the upper image um, on the Jordanian banknote. So, kind of when the project started, I said, amazing, this project is on the money, on the money of Jordan. So, it's so important, there must be a lot of information on it. However, when uh, I started, and I, of course, I was driven by the, let's say, by the um, aims of the project to kind of create a wholesome, and uh, a comprehensive uh, understanding of the project and how it contributed to the um, nation building and the, how it was influenced by modernity and represented modernity for the uh, people of Jordan. Uh, I was um, motivated to look not only for the information of the physical object, which is the project, 
uh, like the morphology and transformation of the built components of the project, but also uh, to look at it as a social product. So how, the, how does it contribute to the social political dynamics uh, in the country, to the decision making, to the control and use of the project and how people um, use it and interact with it. But also it became a kind of an object of uh, archival representation. So uh, the aim was to look for architectural drawings and other kinds of documents became very important because um, it's a bit different. So uh, as architects, uh, although we, at the end, we aim to produce buildings, which are physical objects, actually what we produce with our hands are drawings. So we produce plans and sections and elevations, and uh, so representations of architecture. And other people take these representations and convert them into materiality. So producing architecture is quite different uh, from archiving architecture, which is archiving of representations and not of the actual objects. And it's quite different from writing about uh, architecture, as um, and we can discuss at length later. So um, the interesting thing about archival representation is that it focuses on fixity, authenticity, and authority. Because as we know, the material buildings, they change and transform with time, and people contribute to them, and some of them get demolished or added to or, or what have you. However, when we come to archival records, the authentic documents are very important. So um, in my search, I was like really looking for original drawings. Um, and although I didn't come across um, many or any, what I came across was uh, digital representations of these, um, uh, of these uh, documents. So in my plan to find the um, uh, information, of course, I started by identifying the, um, the people who might, or the uh, organization who might have information. And of course, I started with the client and the representatives of the client, like the royal court, because it was a, a project commissioned by the, uh, by the king at the time. And they have a documentation center and also the Ministry of Youth because they are the, like the um, sponsors of the project at the moment. Also the Ministry of Public Works, which was responsible for the building and the uh, municipality of the city, which of course should have the plans. Uh, unfortunately, very little uh, documents were recovered uh, from these um, uh, agencies. So um, I went looking for the contractors who built the project, and um, although one of the companies is dissolved, which is Shaheen Contractors, the other one still exists, but they unfortunately didn't have um, documents going back to that phase. The Jordanian Contractors Association is quite important, and they do have an archive, but it's quite recent. It, it was uh, created only in the, in the last few years, so they don't have any documents which go back to that uh, extent. So I started looking for the architects, so who designed this project? And um, I found some information that it was designed by, and the name was written in Arabic, it's what Muntz um, wa Kennedy. So with some research, uh, I was able to find that it discussed. It's actually a Muntz and Kennedy partnership, uh, which is uh, based in North Ireland, but they also had uh, offices in London and other places. It had a very interesting um, uh, story of formation and how they became uh, quite active in the region. Um, unfortunately, like for example, the engineering association, it, uh, the project predated it, so well, at least predated the archive of the association, so it wasn't there. Uh, I also tried reaching out to um, Riba in London and to um, the Royal Institute of the Architects in Ireland and the Irish Architectural Archive and I wasn't really expecting any responses, but um, actually, um, like uh, as luck gives it, it was covered and everybody was digitally active. So actually, uh, they got back to me, but unfortunately, didn't have um, much documents about uh, the office, the architects, and no documents about the project in Jordan. However, um, like I was quite lucky to identify some uh, documents like, for example, uh, these I found at the city itself, and it's used by, at least it's preserved by one engineer uh, due to curiosity. I mean, this is a um, kind of a copy of, a, of an original plan, and although it's not a very high quality, it's not very high quality, but it gave me indications of the names of the contractors and some of the signatures of the people who signed off on the drawings. This is a, a picture of a blueprint of a plan which existed like a few months before I went looking for it. So uh, I heard of its existence, but I couldn't actually locate uh, the, the paper itself. Uh, it, it could be destroyed, it could be lost, it could be in a drawer somewhere. Uh, I hope so, so maybe we'll find it uh, later. 
However, kind of leading from one uh, breadcrumb to another, um, I came across a very lucky find, which is um, um, actually it's his, a professor in North Ireland, in Ulster, who was very interested in the architects who designed the project. Who are, um, his name is Peter Larmo, and he was kind enough to send uh, and to connect me with the um, uh, publications he uh, did in 2018 and 2019 about James Muns, the, um, the owner of the office, and also the kind of the, the protagonist in the story, and uh, Ade Roche, who is um, kind of, at that period he was um, a well-practiced architect in um, in North Ireland and in and like in other parts of the world. However, they uh, they never kind of got international fame. But however, this was an amazing find because I was able to know more about the, their methodology and um, how they thought. Also to find precedence for the project. So, um, kind of it's, it's, um, it, it was an interesting journey to, of looking for information. Um, so I was quite disappointed by the um, scarcity of archiving in Jordan. Uh, information is there uh, to some extent, but it's highly fragmented. And um, it's still kind of an individual effort. So um, well, I, I hope at some point we can achieve uh, something uh, that like uh, we've, we've seen in Lebanon and other countries. There are archives. Uh, so um, for example, at universities, at um, like different centers, at uh, the um, ministries and what have you. Uh, but some of them are functional. So for example, at the Ministry of Public Works and what have you would find some archives, but they're not easily accessible because they are considered to be professional, so, um, and you have to go through a very long process and sometimes you have to kind of accept that they tell you that uh, there are no drawings. So for example, I went to the Ministry of uh, Public Works and I kind of insisted, oh, I want to see the papers. I want to see that it's not there. And they're just like, no, just you have to believe us. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so in general, like, I, I tried, I, I was trying to understand why is the situation like that? Why is the, um, let's say, the historical uh, paper material, why are the historical representations are not being so considered and taken uh, care of? So maybe, I mean, we could blame colonialism and kind of issues of identity and nationalism. It could be kind of a mindset we inherited from like previous um, um, considerations of um, architectural documentation from uh, previous uh, Islamic periods because in Islam in general, I mean, some, uh, some theorists uh, have said that uh, the um, documentation is not textually available. So people didn't use to document architecture as text uh, and not um, as much, also not so much uh, as drawings. So we don't really have a lot of um, historical evidence of architecture in, this, in countries of Islam. It could be a reason. I mean, uh, there's a lot to be discussed there. Um, so. I mean, there's a lot of ontological uh, concerns, but also logistics and funding are um, a big concern. Like in, in other um, researchers, for example, when I used to go to archives and ask them about old drawings, for example, of uh, buildings the British built for, for, for example, the military camps in the 40s or 50s, which are quite important, They're like in principle, they should be preserved. And for example, the response was like, oh, we didn't have space, we had to burn them. So like, there's still a lot to be done for uh, information preservation. Um, so um, also like uh, I found this uh, mindset that, oh, we don't have to document this building because like whoever comes to add to it later, they will document it again. So um, the, this mindset of temporary and transient documentation um, and, as, and piecemeal documentation is present uh, in the minds of the practitioners. Uh, so I imagine that in UK and Ireland, I would find amazing archives. Um, however, it was also fragmented. So for example, uh, I expected to find much more information about the architectural office and their, and their activities. I, I found some, quite little, but not uh, as much as I expected. And maybe because it was a, pro a project uh, in foreign land, they didn't uh, really um, okay, skip this. I didn't really have a lot, uh, any information on it. Of course, the project also involved, um, the chapter in the book involved photographic documentation, so the, documenting the physical object and the changes that happened to it, which was, I mean, a quite uh, straightforward. Uh, it was the easiest part of the um, uh, information seeking. 
but also we looked at the um, the youth city, the sport city as a social product. So this involved direct observation interviews, interacting with, with the people and with the spaces. And although uh, this was um, a time of Corona, so we still had uh, COVID in Jordan and the limitations posed by COVID, it was quite an active place. And maybe that's because it's a green space and it's open, open space so people were um, attracted to visitors. Um, I also covered the media. So uh, going to the British Library, looking like for any um, newspapers which could mention the, um, uh, the project. And actually I found some in the Times and in Belfast Telegraph, um, which, told, which gave me pieces of the story of how it was um, um, conceptualized, uh, the process, but also maybe the view of the British towards Jordan and towards the projects we, which were built there. A very interesting story was also the uh, story of the con how the project came to be, because it uh, turned out to be a gift uh, from uh, the king and um, his new wife. Um, of like, He got married to Princess Muna in 1961, and she was of British descent, so um, partially this uh, was a gift to the, to the Jordanian people to kind of placate them because she was kind of a daughter of the colonialists. So this is one version of the events which I, which I was able to uh, derive from, um, from the medium. Uh, the media also, like I went to the National Library in Jordan, looked um, like across numbers of uh, um, newspapers from that period. I found some information, like for example, this model uh, of the project. Uh, however, the, uh, like it was, um, the information was very little and um, I expected much more mentions. One of the lucky finds was a brochure about the city, which contained information about the, um, uh, the components, uh, the activities uh, that were there, and they really uh, enriched um, um, like, uh, the, um, the contributions image of the social activities. And another lucky find, I mean, this, this came at maybe towards the end of the project, um, and it's one of the um, uh, kind of very rare photographs showing the um, people from the, um, um, from the uh, North Irish office showing the project to the king and to uh, different ministers from the cabinet. And in this picture, we actually can see some of the drawings which were presented. So they are watercolor drawings of 3D, 3D um, views of the project. And I mean, uh, I haven't seen these drawings anywhere or any, I didn't find any mention of them. But it's nice to see kind of what kind of representation was used um, at that point in time. So, um, yeah, so, as I mentioned, the um, impact of COVID was important, so it was actually positive in my case, because people were more responsive. Uh, impact of chance is also very, um, uh, very important, so like, if I keep digging, maybe I'll find something else. Um, like in some cases, the data has obtained commodity status, so people would not give it to you like, um, for the good of their heart, maybe they want something in return. Especially now, um, like in some cases, not in this case, but in other cases, data is being sold, so you cannot really access data. And the whole mindset of being kind of generous with data has changed. Uh, so uh, this text, which is in the book, is, is a process, it's a point in process, it doesn't represent the full story. So hopefully uh, when people read, read um, the contribution, they will find out more data uh, about the, um, the city and maybe kind of enrich our debate about it even more. So yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jesse, thanks a lot. I think it's very impressive in uh, two things. I mean, the one thing, I mean, it is of course a major public works. I mean, maybe the biggest public project of the um, period. Oh, I, I mean, it's not, uh, in, in, to have so little archival information on that is really shocking. Uh, the other thing is, and I think that is, we benefited in the book from that, that kind of by the lack of this uh, material, you much more focused on the social and political uh, dimension of the project which is, of course, I mean, we still miss the kind of the, the more information on the architecture and the engineering and so on, but which was, of course, for us a big uh, uh, gain uh, in, in, in for your research. Okay, so, uh, and then uh, as last speaker of the round, we have Rael Samuri, uh, who has even maybe an even more challenging job in researching a project. 
the worst maybe <laughs> and he, he I don't know if I should say that he was not volunteering on that I mean it was the idea to research that was coming out of a discussion and because it was not so obvious but it was it turned out to be extremely difficult uh, he, he has a PhD from the Royal College of Art in London and a master's in urban design from the Pratt Institute he's an architect and uh, academic based in Syria, so he's teaching there. He has his own studio in Damascus uh, with award-winning designs, and he is chairman of the Department of Theory and History of Architecture at the Damascus University. And so we are looking forward to your you uh, story. <laughs> thank you very much, Philip, and thank you very much, George, for inviting me. Um, searching for information is the title of the uh, speech which uh, uh, actually George uh, I wouldn't say forced on me but uh, <laughs> I was uh, I had in mind that I'm going to talk about the subject matter which we researched but um, George thought that uh, maybe I could give a general a general view about uh, searching for information in Syria in these difficult times not only in war but also in COVID and COVID war COVID so to uh, when we speak about the searching of information, we are necessarily speaking about sources of information. And when we speak about sources of information, we are speaking about the lack of sources of information and the destruction of the source of, uh, sources of information in wartime, wartime Syria. Um, uh, but first, let me just uh, show you how we chose this, this project. Um, can I stand? Can I stand? Yes. <laughs> no, I just wanted to point, point out here that uh, when we were having our first uh, Zoom meeting with uh, George and uh, Philip, uh, this is uh, myself and my, my partner, Professor Rafi Haqqi, uh, who is a collaborator. He couldn't make it here because he is stuck in the States for uh, uh, immigration problems. He couldn't come, so he sends his uh, uh, regards. So uh, I was trying to convince... Um, Philip and uh, George to include this monument as a uh, example of this uh, exercise, and uh, I didn't continue my uh, my uh, sentence. This landscape and this space caught the eye of Philip, so he said, so "Forget forget about the uh, monument and uh, please look, try to uh, research this." Uh, the problem is that this ha this is, is no more; it doesn't exist. It has been transferred to outside of the country, so we were. Uh, sort of like archaeologists uh, digging. In this space exactly now there is the modern uh, Damascus Opera House. So anyway, we, we decided that um, as a compromise we keep this, which is the emblem of the uh, Inter Damascus International Fair, was, which, which is located here, and we include the whole area here uh, uh, as part of the exercise. So we had, um, uh, as a change uh, from the other contributions of our colleagues, instead of a building or a mass, there was a large space uh, which was very active in the city in the 50s, 60s, and very early 70s, then, one, then it was dismantled. So uh, just to give you a very uh, quick description, there, there is this monument, which is the emblem of the uh, Damascus International Fair, and then there are these pavilions for different countries, which define a space, and there is here this main building for retail, and then there is all these lands landscapes and uh, uh, water features alongside the river Barada, which runs south, south, uh, sorry, um, east-west of the uh, capital, capital Damascus. And this is a view of the other side. You can see here the different pavilions defining this space. So, but I mean, I'm not a historian, I'm uh, more into theory. Um, I will give you in a nutshell what we found actually. Very interesting that uh, the fair was, a, was an architectural and urban idea which uh, was transformed into a new concept of space uh, as perceived by the public. So the public uh, actually took over the architectural uh, plans or architectural idea which uh, the architect propo proposed and the administrators and, and owners, they had, an, they had uh, an idea that this was a Syria, 
an emerging economy at that time uh, in, in the region. And they wanted to, oops, they, they wanted to uh, have other uh, countries showcase their uh, merchandise and, good, and goods. Uh, on the other hand, we have a, also an interesting idea. The monument was a specific emblem of the uh, uh, fair itself, which has been transformed several times into other, other meanings. People who are interesting, maybe uh, Lama, uh, interesting, uh, interesting in um, uh, semiotics and sim symbolisms and uh, structural linguistics would find this really very in interesting transformation about how, what does a sign really mean and how it is transformed not by the architect himself, but by people having different perception, different discursive uh, narratives in order to have a sort of an identification with the, with the monument itself. Information lost. Now the state of uh, searching and information in Syria. I'll just give, as uh, George has asked me, a, a very quick overview of what, how we can, how, how anybody who would like to do research in Syria would uh, go about it. So the, the problem is, a, is a, the systemic and um, embedded in the collective unconscious of the people since very old histories. There is always the reliance, I know this through my family lineage, uh, always the reliance about the or oral tradition because most of the information and documents throughout history has been either stolen or dismantled by the Mughals, the Crusaders, and what have you. So there is always the tendency to, with, with, to um, hide information or to disperse it in even uh, the documents and the books and the, the famous, uh, famous historical um, uh, manuscripts. Creating the modern East, modern Middle East or modernity in the Middle East actually has to be understood uh, after the uh, World War I. This is a very interesting for, uh, book. I recommend it very much. A piece to end all peace. I mean, the, the situation in Syria is not far from this uh, uh, line or timeline of uh, the problems created by the political politics of post-World War and then post-World War. The, no, the not notorious um, uh, Sykes-Picot uh, um, Accord or whatever you like it, whereby the uh, the shape, the geographical fact, the geopolitical shape of Syria took its place. Um, a lot of people would like to uh, identify Syria as this whole region, uh, while while we uh, now have it like this, or even now even more cut. And here you can have the, an idea about what happened to the, to the uh, institutions which store the uh, archive system, which is mostly in the basements or the annexes of museums. This is the, uh, what's left of the uh, National uh, Manuscript Archive in Deir ez Oops. And this is in Raqqa. This, this, is, this is by Daesh, this is the, uh, by the Americans, its previous state, and of course the tragedy of even destroying the heritage. And we all know this iconic uh, uh, photo uh, taken by, by Getty uh, of the, uh, actually, the Iraqi, uh, which is the similar, I mean, Iraq, you have to, you have to see that there is a sort of a cultural unity here between the two countries. And also you can see the archives now destroyed. Or if you want to, you know, this is the, this is the new map, the, the areas of, uh, now, now the new archives are relocated and dispersed in di different areas. So now if you want to have, uh, like my son, for example, is, is doing research now in a, uh, city uh, very very close to here. Half of the archives are with a different faction. Half of the archives are with the with the government. I will show you it later. But uh, there is a little bit of hope of people doing sort of recording recording the the, the um, 
what's left of the heritage. Students, workshops with the Chinese, with uh, the Russians, with other factors. Post-war Syria is now uh, very much in the public discourse of people uh, working in the area. You can, hear, you can see here the posters that students are generating. This is my son, and this is the area where he's, he's studying. He's, he's doing his uh, research about uh, rebuilding the city of Ma'arra, Ma'arri, and he's doing uh, something called the Ma'arrium, which is analogical to uh, the Dantium, because it is known that uh, Dantium was very much interested in the Apostles of Forgiveness when he wrote his Divine Comedy. So uh, uh, now he's uh, getting his uh, information from the BBC archives, from all the, uh, the, the, the journalists who have been there or have not been there, and he's, he's, uh, he has to pay for all of them, actually. And in post, this is a commercial, in, in post-war re rebuilding, I, I was shocked when one of my favorite buildings, which is the, the School of Paradise in Aleppo, was, uh, was destroyed, and uh, I wrote a manifesto for post-war post -war re reconstruction rather than having uh, the ability to restore the, 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 the school itself. Now, uh, I will just go through the, the three or four main um, uh, places whereby you can have uh, an idea about the archive. This is the uh, school of Zahiriya, uh, very close, about uh, 100 meters from the uh, Great Umayyad Mosque. Now it's Dar al-Kutub al-Wataniya, which has all the uh, archives, now trans transferred to the uh, National Library. And you can see here the scholars, uh, old and new, uh, using the old systems of card cataloging and so on. There is also the uh, National Museum, and it's, uh, thank God, now it's intact. They have all the uh, uh, archives of the Palmyra uh, Museum and the other, the Raqqa Museum. Now they have one copy of the things which have been stolen in terms of archives. Uh, I don't know if you know this building. This is, the, this is by Ikoshar. And this is the National Library now, where, where everything is sort of centralized. They're trying to create a national archive stamp system, and now the students and young uh, architects and uh, documenters are uh, digitizing the whole National Archive. You, you also have, uh, uh, as, as George has uh, suggested, the uh, reliance on NGOs and uh, people, key figures here. Now there is the Moaz family uh, Moaz Jr. and Moaz Sr., uh, who have an amazing uh, archive. Uh, it's, a, it's a family archive. But un unfortunately, it's not modern archive, it's uh, ancient archive. And here you find Khalid Moaz with Jean Sauvage in, out, just outside Damascus. And this is Abdel Razak Moaz, his junior. And now he's working in Bonn. So maybe we can contact him also. Then there are three very important figures, uh, Armashi, our main source, and Kawakbi, and Tuer. They all, all of which have uh, amazing uh, personal and family archives. Unfortunately, the one in the middle has been lost. And then, unfortunately, uh, uh, Khalid al-Asad, uh, who uh, was killed by uh, the ISIS ter terrorist uh, uh, defending the uh, documents and uh, statues of Palmyra. This is an in interesting quote by him. Uh, NGOs also, there is the Ifipo, the French Institute, very, very active. I think, uh, Mercedes, you know, it, you know these people. And then there is the Gotha Institute, and it's, now it's redundant, of course, and I take this opportunity to invite you back. And of course, uh, the GTZ, who did a lot of good work in Aleppo, and the archaeological, German archaeological institutes, very, 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 they have been really very helpful, especially in Aleppo. 
Now, uh, the last thing which is now taking place is the National Archive. Uh, and uh, um, instigated by Amar Kherbek. Amar Kherbek is the uh, George Arbid of Syria. <laughs> but not in architecture, unfortunately. Unfortunately, I have to say that there is, not, there is no appreciation or very little appreciation for modern architecture uh, in, in Syria in terms of uh, preserving it or looking at it uh, aesthetically or whatever because of the great other uh, old traditions which are you know, always researched and documented and excavated. The interesting thing, uh, uh, George, is that when they did their first conference, uh, they also used this emblem our emblem, uh, and in the background you have the, uh, the opera house. Again, going back now to the, uh, to the fair, this is uh, how we uh, went along to see the archives with the president. So it was this, and this, and from all this, we only managed to collect this. And this was the contracts of this dismantling the, the international fair. And all we can find in terms of architectural documentation was this tirage, this uh, blueprint, which was the pr blueprint of dismantling the, the fair and not the, 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 the identifying the pavilions, their architects, the, their countries. And it didn't have the architect. This is the only information we had. You can see here, as Suri, uh, whatever, uh, a Rusi, uh, handwritten uh, haphazardly, which is the, 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 the Syrian pavilion, the Russian pavilion, and, and so on. And unfortunately, because this here was the hangar whereby it was bombed by the terrorists outside of the country, and we had, uh, we lost, because it was very, very close to, the, uh, to the, uh, the Faculty of Architecture where we work, we lost, unfortunately, 15 students. And this was how they were documenting in Syria now, with no, elect no electricity. They are using the, uh, this, is, this, this is the graduation project of students using their torch work, work in order to uh, showcase the, the preservation work. And of course, we went to the archives also. We had some interesting archives. This is the area of the uh, International Fair Old. And you can see here the wing of the French Air Force uh, just before they were about to destroy uh, the uh, neighborhood of Sidi Amoud, which was the most beautiful uh, uh, and thriving um, neighborhood of all Damascus. So it's interesting how one uh, looks for sources. And this is the new as-built AutoCAD uh, plan that we managed to salvage. I'll show you here some of the uh, photos we managed to collect from newspapers and from the ar archives of the National Library. You can see here the, the spaces and from, from the north-south, and this is from the south-north. These are all the pavilions here. The Soviet pavilion, Almania, we don't know the architects, of course. Uh, the Lebanon, and this is very interesting, Jumhuriya al Arabiya which is the, uh, uh, the unification of Syria and Egypt, albeit for about three years. So we had uh, the same pavilion for... Uh, and then also in the newspaper, we, man we managed this, this is the Cinerama, the first in Syria after America. And here you can find the Americans showcasing their Cinerama. Cinerama. In the pavilion, interestingly, it was designed by Buckminster Fuller, the a geodesic dome. Unfortunately, we have absolutely no photos, we have, but we have, by word of, of, of mouth, from some of the last living people. And here, we, this is the Cinerama arriving in this uh, American uh, plane, and the stamp of the uh, American uh, university, and the, uh, sorry, American embassy. The Vienna Philharmony poster. We, we, we managed to get information through the posters of the graphic designers. Feirouz 
which is the celebrated Lebanese uh, uh, singer also. Each year they, they uh, had a new show and knew it. And uh, I know my Egyptian friend, friends here will find this amusing. All, all the com comedians, uh, Egyptian comedians, used to come and uh, make films uh, in, the, uh, in the fair. So this is just to give you an idea about how, how successful this was into the public. The public thought, uh, claimed ownership of the, of the space, and it was not uh, anymore for uh, trading or businessmen. They, it, was an, it was an event, it was a social event. And I know from my, my, my family, my mother and my aunts used to go to the tailor every year before the, uh, the event in order to showcase their uh, uh, dresses and their hair. And uh, Would you like me to continue regarding anything regarding the monument? Or is, can, I, can I go on? This is, this is the monument. Uh, overlooking the Umayyad Square, which is the main uh, square in, in Damascus. Uh, it was bombed several times. This, this was the, this how they, uh, I don't know why they bombed it, but uh, probably to destroy this national icon. And here, this is the Faculty of Architecture where I work. 98 uh, killed. But you can see here the, uh, the uh, fair and the monument in, in its uh, heydays. So you can see here the monument itself, and the green here is the area, which a little, extends just a little bit to the other side. It is mostly a slender 40-meter double-curved uh, structure, concrete structure, with a lattice work, uh, which is supported it, supporting it. And then you have the... Uh, um, flags, uh, the flags of the, all the countries participating in each, uh, in each and every uh, um, year because they changed. Some of them just opted not to, not to participate. Mm -hmm. So also, we didn't find information about this. this is, it's a funny story, really. The narrative took over the end product. Uh, we found the grandchild, 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 it doesn't look like a grandchild, but anyway, <laughs> we found the grandchild of the owner of the cement factory, the very first cement factory in Syria. And it, they found it very interesting to donate the cement in order to promote the cement in Syria, the local cement, because we used to, we used to import it from Egypt and from France and from other people. So this, this is one source of information. And then, what was it? it? It was actually the emblem of the unity between Syria and Egypt. And you can find here President Nasser and President Khouatli of Syria. Uh, and in interestingly, this was the emblem of unity, the emblem of this unity one time. Uh, we tried to find who is the person who gave the, this uh, motif. And one of the stories, this is a likely story and this is not the only story, is Saleh Abdel Karim. I say this likely because we find it as circumstantial evidence, not the exact evidence. We don't have any uh, plan with the signature of the architect. And uh, we had to write to the syndicate of engineers in, in Egypt through uh, one of our uh, colleagues, a very good cont contributor. He's an architect, Walid Shahabi. You know his daughter, she, she studies here. And the, uh, the, they said that we know that's the, of this person, but unfortunately he died. They, sent, they said that we, but we know that the structural engineering was done uh, as part of the protocol of cooperation between the, the northern region, which is Syria, and the southern region of the United Arab uh, Republic. And it was sent back. So they sent him this, uh, 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 blueprint. It says here Hassan Rizq Hassan. This is this is the structural engineer. So uh, Mr. Shabi uh, only showed us this. He didn't even give give us the. Uh, you can see here the structural uh, um, study of the. Hay. Interestingly, the box of information is it has no information at all. They just put the matrix with, with no information. 
The origins of architectural form, also through th uh, circumstantial evidence, could be traced to the palace of the president of Brazil. Why? Because, uh, because uh, at the time uh, of, uh, of its building, uh, Saleh Abdel Karim, the Egyptian sculptor, sculptor was receiving a uh, sort of a, uh, what do you call it, a, a prize for his, uh, for his work in Brasilia. So he must have seen this motif of the palace and this is how he interpreted. Of course, this is the study, the comp comparison in scale between, between the two. Uh, another good uh, um, evidence is that uh, it was the emblem of the uh, United Arab uh, um, uh, Republic at that time. But who is the architect? <laughs> at, at that time, we were, we, this was very uh, popular. Anyway, we managed to go to the archives of Nizar al farra who we know, we know his... his uh, his daughter, she was our student, and she opened the archive and showed us the circumstantial evidence of her father uh, on the scaffolding of the, uh, of, the, of the monument. So she thought that this was the most uh, striking evidence, and she claimed that her father actually did. Uh, <laughs> did it. So everybody, even, even the mayor claims that he designed it. Everybody is claiming that he you know, designed it. So uh, she said that he designed the, uh, the lattice work here and cooperated with Abdul Qadir Arnaut, which is a graphic designer, in order to make the subdivisions in order for the flags to fit. And we managed to contact his son, this is Abdul Qadir and his son in, in, in his studio, and he confirmed. But unfortunately, it took a sort of a nice comi co comic uh, turn. The, the, the countries started fighting. Why is the uh, flag of this country above us and why is the way? So uh, he had uh, this new uh, idea of uh, no flags, only colors. So this is one of the other transformations in this uh, interesting sto story. Uh, later on, when the, uh, the fair was dismantled, um, what to do with the, the monument. And it went to the ownership of the Ministry of Culture, whom this person, Walid, Walid Shahabi, was working there, and this is, this is he with, with the architect. He, he, he was starting collecting his archives while the architect was still alive. So uh, he said, so what to do with it? it okay, let's give it the... One, yes, okay, let's give it just one, uh, one final twist. He said that it's very similar in motif to the handle of the celebrated Damascene sword. Uh, they agreed discursively, and after that, it was called forever the Damascene sword. It was given to this uh, graphic designer who designed this sort of stained glass window depicting the sword uh, and, and, and uh, as it moves in time and space and celebrating uh, the, the, uh, the strength of the Arabic nation or something like that. And now it's also the, the emblem of the, of the uh, uh, um, uh, fair outside the city, which is in a different location altogether. I'll just flip through the slides. It even mourns here, you can find here the they use it everywhere and everything, even in COVID, stay at home. And finally, I just end with this. This is my take on when I was uh, designing the, oops, the, uh, my proposal for the international, uh, the, sorry, the, 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 the National Museum. I extended the sword uh, um, uh, metallic uh, uh, component in order to cover the whole. Uh, so it's, it's another transformation. It's in the last transformation, and I don't think it's going to work anymore anyway. Thank you. Sorry for uh, taking too much time. Um, so uh, thanks a lot to share with us this kind of detective story <laughs> you, you went through. I would like to give the Investigative journalism, yeah.
And I would like to give the audience possibility for questions or statements, and we are kind of running out of time. I think we can be a little bit over time as we started to delayed. But I think there are many people in the room who do research in this field, have uh, experience with this question, and uh, maybe we would like to comment or ask something. I have a question about identification. Um, when I was working on many cases in Egypt, a lot of people would show up, uh, or sometimes I would chase people, who would claim that my father built, designed this. Um, it's an open question for the panel, but also everybody else, because obviously, as we know, in the different contexts, uh, well, A, the notion of the architect as artist, that so there's one name that should be associated with a project, which is a very kind of a Western art historical model for identification, which may not necessarily operate in all contexts where other groups of architects sort of share a project. So how do we, how do we, does everybody propose uh, dealing with these kinds of things? Because sometimes they're not lying. Sometimes one person's father did the metal and the other person's father designed, like you said, the stained glass and another person's father designed the concrete, but each person thinks that their father, out of some sort of um, pride, uh, is the sole author, uh, since everybody's sort of uh, looking for that kind of um, connection. So but how can we have a discussion about this uh, identification and authorship? Yes. Um, in this particular case, uh, Muhammad, um, we found that the narrative was more important than the end product or the architect because it was so successful, these two elements, the, the, the monument, and it was so successful, and the identification itself came from the, pub, the people who are the clients, rather than the intentions of the architect, or the, or the uh, administrators, or the officials who uh, funded or um, decided this, the, that this, this space is going to become this or that. So uh, the narrative took over, actually, or the narratives in the plural, By the time you get the, the microphone, I have a quick story, a funny story to tell. 1946, there is a competition in Beirut for the post office. There were six participants, and the result were as such. One of the participants will uh, build as a contractor, the second one will do the iron work, the other one will do the mechanical work, and so on and so forth, because at the time, they were not so specialized, so they would do, they were men of all trades, they would be engineers and architects and so on. And this idea of signature, and I, uh, as Wael mentioned very well, you will notice also in the book that sometimes there is a lot of stress put on the authorship of the architect, depending on who that is, like Zivago and others. And in other uh, instances, it is the whole story and the architect is somewhere in the background. And I think this is, this, this is the richness also of such uh, if it is a success story, everybody claims it. If it's a failure, everybody will just... Uh, a uh, question for George. Um, George, I've always appreciated what you do with the center. Um, I think it's incredibly important. And Beirut in general has actually been quite a pioneer in preserving heritage in general. The work that you do, the work of the Arab Image Foundation, several private collections, etc. But you presented to us such a smooth narrative, you know, about the establishment, the work you've been doing, which again is phenomenal. But I'm really interested in hearing about the challenges. I mean, it's very much, you know, um, a grassroots effort. It's, I would say, it's really sustained mostly by you at this stage, which again is incredibly important. But how have you been dealing with kind of the tragedies that Beirut has been experiencing, the blast recently? I mean. You showed a huge window. I'm sure, you know, your center was affected. How do you deal also with the politics? Because even though it is a grassroots effort, I'm sure you have to constantly kind of um, deal with uh, not only the lack of support, but sometimes maybe harassment from political entities. 
Uh, can you please tell us a little bit more how you've been surviving this? Okay, thank, thank you for the question. Uh, I will start from the end. There, there, there are no, there's no pressure from authorities. They're, they're not concerned with what we do anyway. They're doing their own business and so on. So for this, I think we are to be blessed because uh, people, you know, it's free, free enterprise, laissez-faire, so you can maneuver within this. There's no problem. But when we registered, it's, uh, it's interesting that you're asking this. When we wanted to register the association, uh, we made a mistake because we said, they ask you uh, as an NGO, who would be your interlocutor? Officially, we said, obviously, the Order of Engineers and Architects. So we are called to, to a meeting with the president of the Order of Engineers and Architects at the time, and he said, do you really want to talk about architecture? It's only here that people talk about architecture and engineering. You're not allowed to represent the profession. So we're not representing the profession. We are innocent people who want to take kids in journey, on journeys in the streets and so on. So we even changed the name of the association. So, so it's not Arab Center for Architecture. Officially, it's Jamia Tahfuz wa Nashr Turath Al Amrani Al Hadith. It's not Hatta Al Amara. We made it a bit general, you know, so that you can operate. So yes, you have to go around things. And for the rest, the blast, yes, we had windows broken. We had to pay, repair, and then again, Goethe. They're providential. They, <laughs> so they also helped some institutions. They paid for the repair of the glass and and uh, But fortunately, the server was uh, not hit and so on. So that we were lucky. And on everyday uh, basis, when we, when also when we uh, started the the association with the uh, board or the people who were the founders, there was a big question: Should we be in an institution? And uh, I have to say that after these years, uh, I'm not sure where we should have been. But I can say that by being in the city and independent and so on, we were free to move because we have very good universities, but they don't talk much to each other. They do their own thing. They are usually gated, not always, but uh, so you cannot arrive at any time. You cannot arrive at 8 p.m. for a meeting there uh, and so on. So we have this freedom, but of course, the price to pay is to constantly uh, worry about whether you will be able to uh, to pay for the ink or whatever. But still, uh, things you, you can manage. And, and we realized that a lot of people would like to support and donate. You know, they would come and buy two copies of the book. They would come bring a whole group for the uh, tour and so on. So you can always survive. And I was talking uh, on the side with the Wael that there is a necessity. And I was really glad uh, to see that the MAMA group was inspired. For me, it's an honor to have inspired the younger generation. And I think there is a need for these active uh, groups in every city, Arab city more collaboration together and so on. And they can take any scale, depending on funding, on how many people are available to work and so on. And now with the digital media, you can be anywhere and make a difference. Mm, there is a question from the online audience, also to George, so I'll just read it into the crowd. Uh, what are the criteria of archiving a building monument? How do we say that we should consider this as modern heritage and preserve it? Is it cultural value, technical value? Uh, yeah, of course, this, uh, we're not reinventing the wheel. There are several uh, criteria that are possible. Uh, you have, of course, uh, the, uh, something that is related to its historical importance, to its social importance, to uh, events that happened in, in it. There is another criteria, which is its urban context and how it, it, it responds and activates uh, the, the context, the urban, urban situation. Uh, you have the aesthetic or uh, like, let's say formal uh, expression of the building. You have the, whether it is a pioneering building in the use of a material in industrialization. You have the spatial devices like for example, let's say the first, uh, first duplex apartment that changed how people live in the apartment. The first uh, uh, curtain wall that transformed even the industry because sometimes you have a bricolage, sometimes they produce something that looks like a curtain wall, but they don't have the technique yet. So they're bricolaging what they want to become, and then technique follows. Uh, so there are many reasons why you would do it. And it's more difficult to convince, of course, uh, that this building should be preserved. For example, the Hotel Carlton uh, is concrete and aluminum and glass. And you are in a country, and most of the Arab countries around us have such an ancient history that it's hard to say, okay, we're not even keeping uh, in good condition architecture that is 2,000 year old, why do you need to care about, about this? I think it's politically important to consider these as heritage as well. 
I mentioned something about it before, but maybe I can, we don't have much time, but it is true that we should consider that we have contributed to modernity. And this is why one of the things that we discussed a lot with Philip is, is the title of the book, it's Designing Modernity. We will speak also about this. I'm teasing you for tomorrow's sessions. We will again <laughs> speak about this in the, in the book discussion. I would like to, I mean, we are already over time, but I would like to pose a last question uh, and maybe also get uh, Labib again uh, into the discussion. Uh, he's, uh, I mean, both of you, Tarek and Labib, and uh, I think Ola already left, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to keep the discussion ongoing in this kind of hybrid format, but um, I want to go back to something uh, John said, said, which I think was very interesting, and a little bit kind of in the course of the discussion it disappeared, because you said that the, the documents or the plans kind of represent like an idealistic form of the architecture, while the objects kind of speak about the kind of transformation. And so, uh, in, in the social interaction in these spaces. And I think that's very interesting because we speak now about a condition where we, in of many cases, we lack the original drawings and the information about the design process and the architects and so on. And so, especially in the, uh, the cases of uh, you two, but also I think in, in, the, in the work which Mama does, it's very much focusing then on the, on the object itself as a source of information. And so you start to do a different history telling, a different perspective on history. Now I can say that, I, I mean, to, to in, in our, in the German context, how problematic this is, kind of the obsession with the original, uh, I mean, there is such a focus on the kind of, on the, on, the, and on the original design and the status of the original design. I was doing a research funding application for a Bauhaus building, which was successful, but the research uh, funding, the DFG, they uh, um, uh, didn't accept our application to research the building as a uh, source of information. It was completely absurd. I mean, they, even in also in our context, there are established uh, cultures, but they said, no, no, that is not a piece of information. You have to go to the documents, not to the building. So I think it would be nice kind of to finish and maybe uh, Labib might uh, like to start because you also showed how you do the research uh, on, the, uh, on the ground, on the buildings, how this kind of changes the perspective on, 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 our, uh, on the architecture. I'm sorry, I just skipped like uh, some seconds uh, when you started speaking, but you're talking about uh, how this research that we're doing is, uh, is, um, is affecting the, the, the knowledge and also it's affecting the, the people, right? Yeah, and that you more go from the building as it stands there today than from uh, historic documents which are sometimes not available. Yes, um, so, so basically... Um, the idea about about getting to the building first um, is about the fact that we often stay into the scholar's sphere. We often stay into the between architects and professionals. I mean, we are in a way aware of this. We are aware of the importance. We are. I mean, we when we walk in the city, at some point, we find a really beautiful building. We take a picture and so on. We loved it already. Uh, but then the people who live in this building, uh, those are the most important people because the way uh, that a bulldozer will come to demolish that building, those people, if they have a history with that building, if they love it, they will defend it. But how they would defend it if, you don't, if, they, if they don't have the, the, this archive material that, that says the story about the building? Uh, uh, and so we always love the fact that sometimes when we go to a, to a building, we collect overall history as well. Sometimes it's like generations living in that building, and we always go with these uh, historic photos and we show them. And uh, I still remember one day we went to a to a really nice hotel built in the seventies, and we started just like going in the village. It's a small village, and then when we when we talked with the people, someone just said to us that actually uh, in the seventies uh, he saw someone uh, just taking some measures and so on, and he was uh, accompanied with the French guy. And so directly in us, in our knowledge as architects and archives, we knew that those, this French guy is Domazier and the other guy is Farawi. So, so we just knew that actually they were in the site and they were taking the measures and so on. 
and, and then they, they start sending us pictures uh, because a lot of people worked in that hotel. So they were like sending us pictures uh, when they were working and so they were so proud. So to, to summarize it, I think it's very important to uh, the work of archiving and the work of getting into the site and getting to, to the material directly is most importantly to, to create this, uh, this pride of having something valued and to, to really, and they become at some point, they become the ambassadors of heritage. We don't, they don't need us anymore in a way. So that's, that's I think, very important in the process. Thank you, So that's you, someone of you, or uh, want to uh, extend on the subject, Janset yourself, or? Thank you. Uh, yeah, one word about the building as evidence. The building is uh, is also an evidence of the changes and the transformations and so on, which often you don't find in drawings. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a complementary thing between you know from the sketch to the original design to how it was built to even even construction drawings to to sometimes remarks written on a on a on a permit and derogations and all of these things uh, are important to understand the life of a building. And I agree with you that the, the, to be uh, a bit radical uh, and anti-Greece, if you want, in, in, in what is a document and what is not. I mean, buildings are documents. They are an open book on a lot of things. And uh, life happens. You know, things happen to a building. And uh, whether you document what happened or not is also interesting. I mean, you, uh, we, we used to give a course at, at AUB with friends. It was a survey course. And uh, uh, often, the, what was interesting to discover in the building and to, for the students to understand and draw were the phases of building, uh, that they would uh, try to analyze and understand that a building is not always a given thing at the moment in time and that remains as is. So the history of the building becomes important because it has to do uh, with, with this idea that Lahbib mentioned, which is that the, the people uh, affect buildings and buildings affect people. Uh, but usually, if, if we look at uh, you know, writing about architecture or history uh, with binoculars, that is, you have the drawing, and then you have the evidence of the building, and you try to match this to that, it's not the in most interesting part. That's the easiest part. Uh, what is the most interesting part is what is in the gaps, which is not uh, drawn or written, and sometimes which is the life of the building that now is even different than that. But, but, but do you see, and then John said, do you see that, in my perspective, there is really a problem in Western thought, because in the obsession of authenticity and authorship, I mean, I, I'm just confronted with a case of, in Potsdam, uh, Rechenzentrum, a GDR building from 1971, one of the few which are still left in the city. And there was a demand to put it under protection. And this was refused because the building was too much changed. And this is completely absurd because actually it's kind of very interesting in the way it has been changed. So also that is telling something. So I, I think it would be almost the reverse. I think because of the changes, actually the building has gained more historic value than it was original. But I think, so in my impression, there is an issue in the Western thought. I don't know if it's different in the... In, 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 the, in, the, in, in your contexts or in other, I, I assume in other cultural contexts, there is a less obsession with authorship and authenticity, and so there is more openness for these processes. John said. Um, actually, I would like to go back to a slide I skipped through, uh, which also talks about archiving and says that focusing on archiving per se is actually not aiding the remembrance of a building, but the for forgetting. So it's in the, in the um, uh, field of forgetting um, buildings because it, it preserves a certain part of the, like a certain memory of the building which was at its birth, the initial stage. Um, and if we divorce it from the actual building in, in its historical phases, we kind of um, obliterate this historical uh, timeline. And also the interesting remark is that uh, the drawings uh, become archives and heritage in their own because like for example uh, during my search for documentation about the sports city so I found let's say replicas digital replicas of the original drawings for example I found some drawings from the 90s um, of like a documentation of the building itself with some additions but these were considered 
less important because they were less of um, a heritage status. I also found some digital like AutoCAD drawings from uh, the 2000s because there were also some additions made to the building. So these were even less important or even not important at all in this sense. So even the documentation of the building and the drawings and the representations um, hold a historical kind of significance and represent different mindsets and different uh, values attributed to certain uh, time periods. So maybe in the future, the AutoCAD drawings will become very important uh, as well, but uh, I hope they still survive uh, at that point. Okay, so thank you very much. We are now uh, 20 minutes over time, so I would propose we have now a pause of 20 minutes and start again at um, uh, 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 20 to 5. I have to uh, apologize, Tarek, that we kind of not, I haven't drawn you back into the discussion, but the connection was very bad. So I, I think we, we appreciate all very much your work and I hope you understand. So we have to be in touch in other ways. Um, so let's meet again in 20 minutes and uh, have a short break. Thank you. <laughs>